It's time. This is why I come to Indianapolis, quite frankly. Oh, they have the opportunity it. to sit <laughs> next to this man, absorb some knowledge, have a great talk about the great game of football. Hey, you're the guy now. You're, you're, you're doing games. I mean, man, I'm just honored to sit next to you. No, the honor is all mine, believe yeah, yeah, me, yeah. from NFL Films. That is the voice <laughs> of the great Greg Cosell in our Combine interview, a yearly tradition, and really, truly the thing that we look the most forward to when we come out here. So let me just start. As well. How the heck are you doing, man? I think I'm okay. So That's far, good. so far, so good. So far, so good. You know, I just finished my 43rd season at NFL Films. 43. So you, I was one when you began this journey. Jesus, thank you. <laughs> I love how you say yeah. that. We're sitting over here yeah. with this guy in his <coughs> early 20s. Oh, yeah, it's all relative, and, this, and you're I, thriving. And I think, I think my first combine may have been 98 or 99. So I've been coming here since then. So 12, few, call few, 25. Few, few changes in the combine since then. A quarter century yeah. of you at the yeah. combine. I like that. I like crazy. That. It is crazy. It is to see what it's all become. I know. And, and you know what I like about it is, yes, all the stuff that goes on for the teams, it's very important. But for somebody in, in our line of work in the media who cover the league, right. the amount of people that you get to come around and just talk <coughs> oh, I, I love is it. I the love best. It. Yeah, it's the best. I love it. Who's somebody that you love to see every year? Who's your Greg Cosell? Oh, well, you know, for years – and he's no longer coaching, and you know him because he was with Cleveland for a couple of years. For years, and, and we're very good friends to this day. In fact, we were texting earlier, is Al Saunders. Ugh. One of my favorite guys, one of my best friends in coaching. You know, I love Al him. and I used to have it. it our, we had a routine. Every year we'd go to P.F. Chang's for dinner, just he and I, and it was awesome. And then obviously he retired, but, you know, we were texting today. I mean, we're still really close friends. I still text with him too. Yeah. He is as good a human as you will and, ever find. And a great coach. Yeah. And and I used to look forward to that so much. And then, of course, he retired. we got to get him to just come to yeah. Indy for the fun and of it. And, in fact, I used to sit with him a lot in the Dome, especially watching receivers. And I learned – the guy's a fountain of knowledge. I mean, I would learn so much about evaluating receivers, what to look for, you know. And, I mean, he, he taught me something that I never – you know, it's funny. You talk to coaches, you think you know stuff. And, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. and You know, you know a lot. Uh, but there's certain things I don't know, okay? Sure. And, and I want to keep learning. That's the key. That's one reason I love coming to the combine and talking to coaches. But <clears throat> he explained to me one year that um, – about how you can teach guys how to catch the ball. Because, you know, people say, oh, he's got bad hands. He said, that's a cop-out. Al would say, that's a cop-out. You can teach guys how to catch the football. And, you know, I never thought about that. I'm sure a lot of people don't think about that. Yeah. They assume a guy either has good hands or bad hands. And he said, no, 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 you can coach them and teach them how to catch the ball by where they place their hands. Right. Get it. And, I, you know, and he t- that, that was a conversation we probably had 15 years ago. But I remember that like it just happened yesterday. That's awesome. And that's yeah. what I think is, that's what is <clears throat> yeah. so cool about this place. And the, you know what, it, in this game just in general, that you can think you know a lot and it's a constant – Thirst for oh. knowledge. I learn every time I talk to you. I talk to one of our coaches. I talk to the Hoff Joe Thomas. You're just constantly learning. No, and that's, that's to me is match. what it's always about. I'm one of those guys, Nathan, when I watch tape, and I know I know a good amount. I mean, obviously, I've been doing this a long time. I've been very fortunate with the people I know and have been able to talk to. But I always think to myself when I'm watching tape that – if a coach was sitting here, he'd be pointing out five things that I'm totally missing, and it would drive me crazy. And by the you way, know. they would be doing it going forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, right, back. Right, right. In a split <clears throat> second, and I know, they I diagnosed know. everything. I know. And you're like, wait, what? I don't you, even you know, know what I saw. I, I always compare, and people might have heard me make this comparison. I, I love to read in the off season. I usually read about 40 books, believe it or not, from wow. like now until, like, let's say, August 15th. And I love to go to Barnes & Noble. I love going to the bookstore. And I get excited and so frustrated at the same time same thing with watching tape because I walk into you know Barnes and Noble and I know there's a thousand books that I want to read that I'm never going to read and it just drives me crazy because there's just too many books yeah. you know and um, you know it's like watching tape I feel like okay there's five things that I'm just missing that if a coach was sitting here he'd point out and I'd go oh man how could I not see that you know that's it's the, the way beauty I feel. of it yeah right? yeah it's yeah. Like- there are yeah. so many things that happen in every play. <clears throat> I know. And I think that that's and one of the cool things about the game. I know. And I can, and because of what I have to do for the matchup show during the season, I Which can't is the best, spend, by the way. I can't spend, you know, five hours just watching one side of a ball. So, right. uh, you know, I have to see certain things and then move on. Right. You know, and if you are people listening at home, and, and I think that there are more, and I don't know if you feel this way, but when you just talk to fans of the game, there are more fans, I think, now than ever that want to watch tape and want right, to right. try to understand the game at a bigger level. If there was one piece of advice you could give somebody about just how to watch tape or the best piece of advice you ever got about how to watch tape, what would that be? 
Well, the way I would answer that is this, because watching tape is a real is a real deal. I mean, it you, you have to be taught how to do it and you have to take it seriously. I think that and and this is I hope this doesn't come across wrong because obviously fans are what drive any sport and the NFL, you know, has a ton of fans. But, you know, my sense when I, you know, we're all on Twitter because we have to be, we're all on social media, but my sense is there's a lot of fans who without any real background, you know, in football, other than maybe they played in junior high or high school, you know, which a lot of people did, go into it with the idea that they really know football. And I think you have to start and accept that you're a clean slate. That's right. That, that football, like any business, is nuanced, subtle, detailed in its own way. And that watching games on TV, that you don't know football by watching games on TV, not the way the people in the business know football. Sure. And, you know, like I said, I hope that doesn't come across wrong because I got to tell you, I didn't play football in high school or college. So when we got the coaching tape in 1992 at NFL Films, I had to learn the game through the coaching tape. And I feel like to this day, I'm still learning the game. Every day. Every day. Yeah. I don't feel like, and I've been doing that, that's 30 years now. And I, feel, I don't feel like, hey, man, now I know stuff, you know. I don't feel that way. Well, and know, I think one of the joys, it's, it's kind of like somebody who's a wine connoisseur, right? They right. enjoy a glass of wine differently or a bottle from this year in this region. And, oh, the climate was like this and that. I can taste that and all those things. You are still learning about, to your point, the nuance of the game. And I think that when you get to watch with a coach. <laughs> Which I've had an opp- opportunity to do in my life, yeah. Is the coolest thing ever because the- they're talking about things that – didn't even occur, at least not to me, for sure. No. And then you gain so much from that. Oh, and you know, fortunately, because I now know a, a, yeah, it's taken a lot of time, a lot of years. But now I can talk to coaches, and they can talk about concepts, and I don't even need to be seeing it. I know what they're saying. I can, I can visualize it in my mind. You know, just because yeah. I've been doing it for so long. Yeah. That's why I like the Manning cast. I think the Manning cast is a great way for people yeah. who want to kind of get into that side of football yep. to hear yep. Peyton talk about it. No, I agree. I agree. I I often watch that on Monday night. Oh, it's yeah, the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do like the fact that he's probably right because he was such a student of the game that pretty much every interception he threw, somebody on the defense didn't do what they were supposed right, to right, do. Right, right, right. And were somewhere they weren't <laughs> supposed to be. Well, it's funny you say that because I remember interviewing Roger Staubach years and years and years ago, and we, we talked about an interception he threw to Jack Lambert in the Super Bowl, and at that point, you know, and he probably feels the same way to this day. He said, Jack Lambert was not where he was supposed to be. <laughs> right. You know, right, right, right. You know, yeah. <laughs> he I wasn't accounting for him. Right, right. Because he was he, supposed to be he over wasn't here supposed in that to be, coverage. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. All right, let's talk for a second about the Browns. And yeah. obviously, you know, bizarre season for a variety of reasons. Yep. A lot of adversity. They didn't have the season you wanted. But now – it's kind of a clean slate, as it you mentioned earlier. Slate. Now you got a full season, a full off season with Deshaun. They brought in Bill Musgrave to help out on the that offensive side of the ball with Stefanski and AVP, and of course the great Bill Callahan over there. When you watched Deshaun <coughs> right. prior prior to the Browns, and then even what you saw this year, what kind of a quarterback was he in your mind? You know, when twenty twenty leads league in passing, and then obviously we had the six game sample size. But what can he be? Yeah, in your and mind? I don't think he was very good this year, but I didn't expect him to be. He hadn't played in a long time. 700 days. Yeah. It's a long time. Hadn't played in a long time. Um, I think if you're going to look at Deshaun Watson at his best, you know, he's a, he's a high-level quarterback in this league. Um, you know, he throws it well from the pocket. He's got excellent movement. He's got great vision on the move. He's got really good spatial awareness. I think he sees things well, feels things well, throws the ball well on the move. I think he's a high-level quarterback. You know, I'm not into lists, so I'm not going to sit here sure. and say he's the fourth best. You know, I don't do that. You know that. You can win with him. You can <coughs> Without win Without question. Yeah. You, you know, he's a high-level quarterback. The assumption is he'll get back to that. Um, and I think that, you know, the Browns are in really good position with him at quarterback. Is this – are we entering a golden era for quarterbacks? You just think about the quarterbacks are in the AFC alone. I know. It's wild. I know. I mean, you're talking Allen, Mahomes, Herbert, Burrow, <coughs> Trevor Lawrence, who I think yeah. very much after that debacle season is, looks like the guy that everybody yep. wanted to go number one. You got Deshaun. You've got, you know, Lamar Jackson's won an MVP, different, somewhat different in his style and approach, but it, it, very dangerous. 
Who knows what Russell Wilson is at this point, but with Sean Payton, I'm not going to write him off, but he's in. He's been a Super Bowl champion. I mean, that's just eight guys in the AFC alone. And we could end up with Derek Carr in the AFC. Back in the AFC, we're going to end up with Aaron Rodgers in the AFC. I mean, it's wild. You stack up the quarterbacks in the AFC <laughs> versus the <laughs> NFC. It's Jalen Hurts and Excuse me. I'm not sure who. Right. Russell, and then, but is this a golden age where you have, just in one conference, half of the teams have a guy that is the yeah, guy? Yeah, I mean, no, it's it, the AFC has those high-level quarterbacks. It's... It's an interesting mix, and I think, you know, it's really interesting now evaluating quarterbacks because more than ever, clearly, coaches do look for quarterbacks that have some movement ability and can make second reaction plays. But there's a balance there because that can't be your number one deal because you still have to execute, you know, theoretically the routine. You have to be efficient and proficient in, in, in routine. But... Clearly, we're seeing, I mean, all the quarterbacks you mentioned, um, and even Burrow to a certain extent, you know, Burrow is not Mahomes or Allen, but Burrow can move. Yeah. And and, and he's a very efficient mover. Subtle in the pocket, and if you need on third and six him to get seven, he's going to get you seven. No, no question. So, I mean, we clearly have seen that those guys are, you know, that 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 trait has become increasingly important. And I think it's in response to defenses because defenses play a whole lot more sub now. So you're getting faster athletes on the field. I mean, now you're even seeing teams play with seven DBs in certain situations. So you're getting faster athletes on the field. You're getting a lot more pressure concepts. You know, each year defensive coordinators are are trying to figure out, you know, different ways to to pressure the quarterback, you know, with, with blitz schemes. So, you know, your quarterbacks are going to have to move. But having said that, you know, when it's third and seven and they rush four and they play zone, you know, you've got to be able to hit, then hit the throw for nine yards and move the chains. Yep. And if you can't do that, then that's a problem. You know, so um, so I think the quarterbacks we're talking about can kind of do both. Yep. Yep. And I think that's – it is a league now – where if you want to play at the highest levels and compete for the Super Bowl, and I'm see if you agree with this, and you have got to be able to throw when they know you have to throw. Correct. And if you can do that, you have a chance. Right. But, you know, it's funny you say that, and, and I agree a thousand percent. But I also think that in an odd way, the run game has come back into the league a little bit. You know, I, look, we would all agree that – you need a quarterback, you know, a higher level quarterback or a quarterback having a great year to get to the Super Bowl. You know, it's hard. You're not getting to the Super Bowl with a bad quarterback. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> but, you know, look at the Super Bowl in the second half. I, I I imagine that pretty much everybody in the stadium and watching at home thought that with the Chiefs down 10, that the second half was going to be a Patrick Mahomes second half. They're going to come out and they're just going to throw the football. Well, it didn't play out that way. No. They handed it off a lot. Pacheco. I mean, Mahomes yeah. made a couple of plays. He's Mahomes. He's great. No one's no one's disputing that. And he made a 26-yard <clears throat> run with his legs. Right. And you know yeah. what? That's okay. Yeah. But, I mean, it wasn't like Mahomes just coming out and tossing the ball around. You know, and so at some point, and, and with each team and each feel of a coach with their talent and game flow and all those things that, you know, 20 factors go into all that, at some point you do need to run the football. Yeah, well, the Browns certainly, with Nick Chubb, can do that. I, right. I, I go stream of conscience with you because you always say things right. that pique my interest. So right. I'm going to go back to the Super Bowl really quickly okay. because I think this is something that you loved. And it's and I'm talking about Andy Reid. So when they would send jet motion in the red zone, the Chiefs figured out that they would the Eagles would kick. Instead of running with, right. the right. responsibilities right. would rotate right. across and the corner would go to the top. And it blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> right, right. To pick that up and then come up with fake jet motions in a Super Bowl right. to get walk-in touchdowns, like, is that the stuff for you that when you pow, think about pouring over hours of film and the way coaches well, do to break that down and find that one advantage and then to use it at the highest leverage moment possible and to see it be that easy? Is that just like, poof, to me, that's that's just awesome. That's the chess game where you have just checkmated somebody. Well, they didn't and, see, and see, that's where the Super Bowl and the fact that teams have two weeks and they bring in all their scouts and everybody to watch tape because – Jacksonville had done that against the Eagles earlier in the season. Yes, it's that play that they went back to. Yes. Right. And and so obviously somebody saw that in all the research and decided that, you know what, here's how the Eagles play that. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to, you know, we're going to try that same play. Because the first touchdown, the one that was to um, – who caught the first one? Um, Sky Moore. Did he catch no, the No, he first was the one? second one. First one was Kadarius Tony. Kadarius Tony was the yep. first one. Correct. Yep. That one, what the Eagles actually thought they um, had a really good plan. 
because what they were going to do, because the Chiefs normally do jet motion. Yeah. They don't do the, the return jet. They, and they did it, I think, three times earlier in right. the game to it make sure that right. that's how they were going right. to react. So that's what they do. So the Eagles had a plan. And you could say it was a really good plan. What they were going to do, because they were in single high in the tight red zone, yep. is they were going to have Darius Slay replace Chauncey Gardner-Johnson as the post safety and have Johnson run across so that Slay would not have to run across and be out leveraged by Tony on exactly the other right. side. Yep. Okay. Yeah, kick it. Yep. So all that happened there, and, and this is fine – work you know by and fine detail is slay took his eyes off tony and as soon as he took his eyes off tony he was done because then tony returns and slay didn't see him return yep so it looks like a bust but it's not a bust in a strict sense you no, know it's taking advantage of right. their principles right and right and, and, then, and then on the second one to to sky Moore, they did the same thing that one avante maddox just went brain dead he just ran inside and and had, you know, had no idea. But the first one, I think, came from really clear film study that, you know, they, they, they knew how the Eagles would play it, and they were going to, you know, th- that was their answer. To me, that is what is so cool yeah. about the National Football I League. I couldn't agree more. See, that's why I've transitioned. And I, by the way, you're the only person that I know that I would talk to and would reference that it would, came from the Jacksonville right. game. I the, love it. I, I um, you know, th- and that's one of the things, you know, when I do – that I've sort of transitioned watching the NFL. I don't watch players as much in the NFL as much as I love the schemes and the tactics. Then when I switch to college, I really enjoy it because now I start watching players more. But, like, you know, I've had writers call me up and say, you know, I'm doing an all-pro team, you know, who your who your guards? And I say, guys, I'd love to help you, but I don't watch the game like that anymore. Like, I can't tell you, you know, with few exceptions, but I can't really – I'm not studying, you know, left guards. We'll stand for Joel Batonio. Don't well, worry about And he's it. a Just good player, yeah. There. Right. yeah. That's good. So you watch the scheme. So let's talk about that. What's the biggest kind of evolution as you've seen it? And then to kind of drill it down to the Browns, we know what Kevin Stefanski's done. Every quarterback that's played for him has right. had their best year with him. Jacoby Brissett was as efficient as he's ever yeah. been oh, in this yeah. offense this year. I thought he had a pretty good year. He he played significantly better than our record indicated right, for right. his 11 right, games. Right. There's no doubt about that. What's kind of the evolution in the schemes? And then in our scheme in specific, what does it do that stresses defenses so effectively and, and can be so quarterback friendly? <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I think my sense is to Fansky in an ideal world. You know, again, things change over the course of any given season. You know, I think in an ideal world, Stefanski is a really good run game coach. You know, I think that that the the use of – the mix of the zone and the gap scheme run game is really strong. You know, once they, they got Wyatt Teller, who's one of the best pulling guards uh, yep. in the league as far as gap scheme runs, you know, they realize that, hey, we got a guy that's really, really good at that, so we need to add that element to our run game because he was thought of, as you know, as a zone guy. Yeah. But, you know, you have to – and plus, fronts – look, there's more five-man fronts than ever in this league, okay? And it's very, very hard to run inside mid-zone – versus five man reduced fronts. It's just hard. It, it's so you either have to work outside with more outside zone or, yeah. or stretch zone or do more gap scheme where you can down block on those three techniques and then work around. So teams have started to add more get teams that are traditional zone teams like the 49ers yep. have added more gap scheme because it's a better way to attack those five man fronts that are permeating the NFL. So I think Stefanski at his core would like to have that start with his offense. Now the question is, because he has a dynamic quarterback now who's more than just an executor and a ball distributor Correct. who can make plays and you know, I don't like saying that phrase, but you know what I mean. Absolutely. It's a cliched phrase, but you know, who can who can do things beyond just execute the play design. Right. You know, the question is does he, I don't want to say does he change his offense because he's not going to change, you know, the whole concept. But what are the wrinkles? But, yes, and what, what is the, sort of what is the div, the balance? What's the, what's the division of labor, so to speak, between the run game now and the pass game? That could change. It should veer more towards the pass it, game. It could well do that. We yeah. don't know the answer to that, but it could sure. well do that because you have a quarterback that is capable of making second reaction plays if, it, for whatever reason, he doesn't see it within the structure of the play is what Kyle Shanahan did, speaking of somebody who has his offense uh, right. like a ballet operate right. in structure, what he did with Brock Purdy as you broke that down, was that one of the most stunning accomplishments 
in coaching and then execution that you've seen? You know, that offense is, you know, you hate the, I hate the term quarterback friendly because it, it, it it's one of those things that doesn't really mean anything. Right. But and maybe and it does maybe to people. More clearly defined <clears throat> right. decisions. Well, that's what it does. Right. I mean, that's the thing that Kyle does exceptionally well is, look, you want – I had a great conversation with it with a, an OC today, and he talked about you know the fact that when you when you call plays in the pass game, what you're really trying to do on every single play, of course it doesn't work on every single play, is generate the primary read being open for the quarterback. That's what you're trying to do. Right. That's okay. the goal. The design. Right. It doesn't happen all the time. Sure. But someone like Kyle Shanahan does that exceptionally well, and. You know, so I'm not saying that Brock Purdy didn't play well, he but did. there's always a mix and a match between quarterback play and scheme. And you know, it sometimes that gets lost with people. You know, they think, oh, if, they think, oh, Brock Purdy, he's great. Now, Brock Purdy played really at a high level. That's not in dispute, but he played in a scheme and an offense that was really that presented him and generated him able to make those define first primary read throws a good percentage of the time. And right. that's what you want. Right. You have you know you read this, if they do this, the ball right, goes here. Right. If they do that, the right. ball goes there. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and and you know, so that's that's what you're trying to accomplish as a coach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And obviously he did it well and that's what I think you asked Jacoby Brissett from his time right. that's what our offense does right, very right, well. Right. Why do you think there aren't more teams and there are more probably than ever, but that are built off of those principles. You have some teams that just like straight drop back game and right. they can be effective because they've got the the weapons outside to dictate right. coverages. But why do you think that <clears throat> right. scheme is maybe not more prevalent than it is? Or is it But I prevalent? think it is prevalent. Okay. Uh, you know, in the coach I spoke to today, he said that he he's counted 14 teams that sort of build off the Shanahan model. So, I mean, that's a lot of teams. Almost that's league. almost half the league. Yeah. So I think it is prevalent. Then it comes down to the specific coach. Just like in any business, some people are better than others. You know, but yeah. I think methodology-wise, yeah. there's a lot of teams that do that. Yeah, and it's, I think it's fun to see. And I think yeah. for the quarterbacks, you know, Deshaun talked about how interesting it is in this offense. What is asked of him right. is actually significantly less in some ways than what was asked of him in Houston in terms of pointing out the mic, setting all the protections. He was responsible for everything there. And in this scheme, <coughs> the quarterback's right. not. It's more... Focus on look, the coverage and deliver the football. Look, look at the Eagles, okay? No no argument that Jalen Hurts has improved dramatically and is a great – And, by the yeah. way, the kid is unbelievable just in terms of his approach. I mean, he's one of those guys. Yep. You know, Josh Allen's one of those guys. Jalen Hurts is one – you know, those are just the guys that they get it, they understand it, they, they you know, they, they know – they go about their their business the, the right, right way. way. Yep. Okay. But the Eagles are not a multi-dimensional complex passing game. You know, the Eagles are. You know, the the Eagles do a lot of uh, the, the Eagles do a small number of things really, really well. Really well. Okay. Yep. Which is no knock on Jalen Hurts. The reason they can do that is because of the Hurts factor. Because when he's in the gun, with all the run game elements that that presents and what the impact it therefore has on the defense and how they have to line up, they don't have to have, you know, 75 different deals in the pass game. They can be... They can have a few because they know how the defense has to be structured because of his run game element that they can really hone in on five or six core concepts, repeat them, repeat them, repeat them just from different personnel and formation looks, and this is the way they can run a really efficient pass game and then add in the fact that they've got big-time talent and then all you know you don't need 100 things. Right. You know, and and I hope people listening don't think that that's any knock on Jalen Hurts at all. No, it's it just not at all. It's a pick your poison situation that yeah, they're able. They to don't line have up. to run a hundred things, right? You know, yeah. be, because of him and the run game element, the pass game can be. Hey, here's our five concepts. Let's be amazingly efficient at those. Just get to them different ways, and and you know what? We can have a big time pass game. Absolutely, mentioned receivers, and obviously the talent they have out wide: right. Devontae Smith, AJ <clears throat> Brown. Browns, I think, and Amari Cooper have, to me, one of the most fun route runners to watch right. in the NFL. You want to get a little bit of speed in there, and I know you've started to look at the receivers in the draft. We are at the combine after all, although we're just right. talking ball. But are there some guys here, and I know you and I talked earlier about the young man from Cincinnati. Tyler Scott. Tyler Scott is kind of a And he's Tyler. probably – I would say Tyler Scott and Jalen Hyatt, maybe a few others, they're going to run 4-3 or, or under. 
So you the know. chances of, of them at 42 probably slim for the Browns. I mean, look, you know, it depends on how you look how you see receivers you know the question becomes you know do, do teams see those guys as more than just speed guys yeah but speed guys get drafted high will fuller a couple of years ago and i don't think he's as good a receiver coming out at, to to me as either jalen hyatt or tyler scott okay. uh, but he went 21st i believe in the draft because speed ends up being a big deal he was and, pretty good with deshaun watson right right and, and he actually got better as a receiver yeah you know uh, he was a speed guy and then he, he kind of learned how to run routes a little better and he got better before the injuries i guess he didn't even play this year really no but is, is he out there as a free agent he is It'd be interesting to see if a team like Cleveland goes after him. It would. Yeah. Yes. It's something we've, we've bandied about right, on right. Browns daily. Um, yeah, it makes sense. But, um, uh, you know, but, but both those guys are probably going to run 4-3 or better because yeah. they're just those guys. And those are, the, those are the names that I've heard that, that would fit what the Browns are looking for. I mean, are they looking for that speed guy? Yeah. Because you've got Amari who can right. win every way right. possible. Right. Donovan Peoples-Jones has developed nicely. You've drafted David Bell. I kind of like Donovan Peoples-Jones. I love Jones. Donovan Peoples-Jones. Great kid. Yeah, I kind of like Great kid. Him. And he's gotten better every yeah. year. Yeah. He works. You talk about doing it the right way. Works hard. He's worked on his body, worked on his craft. Yeah, I kind of like career. him. Yeah. Yeah, good size. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you know, and then it, if they're looking for that, I'm trying to think. Another receiver I like a lot on tape, and I don't think he'll be there at 42, is Zay Flowers. I really like his tape a lot. I think yeah. he fits the NFL game today, can work at all three levels. You can do jet sweeps, orbit reverses, screen game. You know, I really like Zay Flowers. Yeah, that's and that's really what they're looking for. They're looking for somebody that can create space vertically, horizontally. He's that guy. That's what. See, he's, he, and he's a little more advanced receiver than than Hyatt and, uh, and, and Scott in terms of, you know, all, all the elements of receiving. All right, well, we will put them on the Browns' wish list, signed off, stamped, sealed, delivered by Greg Cosell. Let's talk about these quarterbacks really quickly because I know that you love to do that. I love reading your quarterback write-ups every year. I think it's you are so thorough in your evaluation of them. What do you make of this class, just in general? I think there's a lot more questions in this class than people are willing to admit, but because they're quarterbacks, they're going to be drafted high. So we know that. Let's push that aside. Okay. That's going to happen. Yep, that's the position's that important. Correct. <clears throat> so let's let's be as brief as possible. I, I think the best natural thrower in this class is C.J. Stroud. I think Stroud has a natural ability to, to throw with pace and touch, to make those feather-layered throws that you have to make in the NFL. He's an accurate passer. I think he sees things well. He's got enough movement, we saw in the Georgia game, yep. that he can do that. So we'll assume that that can be added to his game. I, you know, if I had to make a list, he'd probably be my number one guy. Okay. Um, I really, really like Bryce Young, uh, but – you know, you, you have to decide how you feel about his size. I was told by someone who knows that he played in the uh, national championship game a year ago versus Georgia at 169 pounds. So, I mean, so even if he's 185, I, you know, how do you feel about a 5'11", 185-pound quarterback in the NFL? It feels like that would be very difficult to survive with the, I mean, the and, monsters and, chasing you. And in some ways, he's like Mahomes. He has unbelievable spatial awareness. He sees things. He feels things. He knows where everybody is. I mean, he, he just has a knack for finding space. I mean, he's a really good football player. Do you think it, it would behoove for the best likelihood of success for him that it is a Houston or it is an Indy so that he's playing indoors? Does that help him I, at his size? He have to deal with the elements as I much? I think it would. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> I think it would. So, again, he's a really good football. And, by the way, I know Bryce Young, and I know his family. The guy's going to blow everybody away. He's absolutely brilliant. Um, he's going to step in and, and be able to run any offense and be ready to play day one. He's that kind of kid. Um, Bill O'Brien gave him total freedom at the line of scrimmage in his first year playing, and Bill O'Brien, as you probably know, is a bit of a control freak. Yeah. So to give Bryce Young that kind of freedom, that tells you how smart Bryce Young is. So <clears throat> he's going to pass every single test, every single test. He'll, he'll be like Andrew Luck in that regard. Okay. The problem is he's going to be 5 all, and, and I'm sure he gained weight just so he, he could have a good number at the combine, but he's not. That's not his playing weight. That's not going to be his playing weight. Right. What do you make of the young man from Florida <clears throat> that is probably the biggest ceiling and lowest floor? So, the, so, the, so Anthony Richards, you start getting into how you 
what value you ascribe to traits, okay? Because Anthony Richardson has three things that immediately stand out. Great size, a power hose, and he can run. There's very little subtlety to his game. You think of like a Joe Burrow, and I'm not trying to compare Richardson to Burrow, but you think of what makes a Burrow great. The, the, the nuances of the position, the details of yep. the position, the, the disciplined craft nature of the position, yep. which you have to have to some degree in the NFL. Okay, Burrow has it at a very, very high level. You know, Josh Allen doesn't have it at the same level as Burrow, but Josh Allen can More do traits. other things. Yep. Right. <clears throat> um, Richardson doesn't really have any of that at this moment in time, but he hasn't played a lot of football. You know, he's a one-year starter. You know, you have to decide as a coach – can you get to that balance, you know, at least cross the line where he can execute and be enough of a nuanced player that you can live with the fact that he's going to miss some things because he can do cool things and special that things. special, right. Right. So he's, he's a total projection. You have to feel really good about him up – mentally and I don't mean IQ you know because I don't get in you know I don't know any of that sure. but I, I spoke to a coach who said that with the year Josh Allen came out he, he was actually with a team that it was the Baker Mayfield year yep so he was with a team that needed a quarterback and he said I had all kinds of problems with Josh Allen's tape but then I spent a lot of time with Josh Allen and I came away saying that guy's gonna make it because of just who he was yep and that it would be important to him to, right. to do what he had to do right. to learn. And so Anthony wants. Richardson needs to be that guy. Yeah. I, I don't know Anthony Richardson, but he needs to be that guy. Yeah. So meetings for him are going to be very important. <clears throat> right. Will Levis, compact power thrower, velocity thrower, can make every throw, great traits, looks the part, little stiff, um, needs to be protected, uh, um, I think needs it pretty well defined for him, or certainly early on. Um, Sounds like Jay Cutler to me. It sounds like you're just going um, Jay Cutler. Maybe. I don't watch enough of his tape yeah, to, maybe. to compare. You know, maybe there's a comparison there. Um, but, you know, I, to me, Will Levis, and, and he may make it and be really good, but I don't think in an ideal world Will Levis is a number, it's a first-round pick, but he will be. It's the nature of the beast. Yeah, there, and who knows? Maybe there's another, you know, I, I don't think, uh, you know, who knows if Hendon Hooker gets in there. I don't know, you know. But, but we know quarterbacks are going to be drafted high. Last one, we'll get you out of here on this. Justin Fields and your evals compared to this year's class? Justin Fields is a physical specimen with a big, big arm and dynamic athletic ability. Um, didn't see things great. Didn't react to pressure great. Um, again, perfect example of he has to cross that line to at least be functional as a ball distributor and executor. Thrower. Correct. Yeah. Right. We know he's dynamic in terms of his, you know, his running ability, his ability to make special plays. But he, right now he's beneath the line of being, you know, an efficient Pocket passer. quarterback. Yeah. Right. And you need that. You need that. That's right. We started that at the top. You need That's that. That's what you need to have. Yeah. And the Browns so, got that in Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson is that guy. He can make special plays, but he can beat you from the pocket. I Deshaun Watson was a really good quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and certainly hope that he gets back there. Yeah. This is the best. I love talking. I could talk ball with you Yeah, for, this is great. Forever. No, I, I love these conversations. Same. Yeah. Thank you so much, hey, man. Greg. Such a pleasure.